Hello, I'm Jamila Masaiva, an international social etiquette consultant and author of Etiquette Books, Etiquette That Least You Need to Know, and Afternoon Tea Etiquette. If you would like to order my books, you can do so now directly through my website. I'll link it here as well in the description box below. If you are a new viewer on my channel, welcome. Here I talk about etiquette, soft skills, self-development. If you're interested in all of that, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell button so you get notified every time I upload a new video. And if you are a returning viewer, welcome back to my channel. I am delighted to see you here. If you are someone who is really interested in learning about etiquette in more depth, you can join my online dining etiquette called Western Etiquette from A to Z that's also available right now on my website. As well, you can join my Patreon movie club where every month I analyze etiquette lessons learned in a particular movie. So far, I have done over 20 different movie analysis and by joining my Patreon movie club, you can access all those movies right now. Today's video is just a Q&A session that I have promised to do and this is to mark the celebration of 800,000 followers right now on my YouTube channel. I am beyond grateful to every single one of you for hitting that subscribe button, for your messages, for your thank you emails, for all the love and support that I have received so far in my journey. I launched my channel in 2019. Uh, I took a bit of a break uh, during the pandemic. I wasn't really regular with my uploads, but thank you for encouraging me to continue doing my work and for uh, sharing my knowledge and um, you know all the things that I want to share with the world. It really means so much to me. And as for a person who creates content online, it's very difficult to understand how and when you're useful because your audience is not live they're all behind the screens so every time i receive these thankful messages i realize that whatever i'm doing i'm on the right path and that gives me so much much more courage to continue doing what i'm doing so thank you so much for being with me and let's get started with this q a session to mark the celebration of 800,000 followers on youtube so in order to do this session, I asked you to post some questions on my community tab as well as on my Instagram to share some of the questions that you have had, uh, you know, wanted to ask me all the time. I received uh, over 100 different questions, but I really had to narrow them down to, I think, 11 questions here. Um, some of them are were repetitive in the way that they were formulated, or maybe some of the questions really refer to the same idea. Um, I tried to narrow down to the ones that were often asked. So I'm trying to just answer, I might be just reading the question of one particular person, but there were many of you who asked questions in a similar um, tone or the similar content. Well, let's get started with the first question that says, uh, what is the most valuable lesson you've learned in life, which is never taught in school or university, that has been one of the ways to succeed? And frankly speaking, uh, albeit school, university and teachers have taught me so much in life, they have educated me, they've given me knowledge. Um, a lot of things that I've learned in life, um, about life, are rarely taught. They're usually uh, conclusions made from certain events or circumstances that happen in your life that teach you that lesson that you can rarely find in school or university. So school and university educates you in a subject. It gives you knowledge, gives you facts and information, but it rarely teaches you uh, how to live life or what life is about or really, you know, what you feel about certain things and who, who you are as a person essentially. Um, so I think a lot of the things that I have learned have been through uh, analyzing myself through introspection, through understanding what were things that ignited me as a child, what were some things that I have, you know, what were some lessons that hurt me a lot, uh, taught me a lot about myself. Um, oftentimes I realize that things I get upset about the most are the ones that I uh, need the most push in. So those are things that really touch me a lot. Um, and I think the most valuable lesson I've learned in life as a person who's very indecisive, who can't, takes a really long time to make a decision is just to act upon your, your, you know, immediate, whatever idea you have. And planning is great. I do plan a lot of my things that I am, you know, doing, but I realize that planning can get you just so far. Uh, the rest is really upon you acting on the plan, um, is, Another thing that I've learned as well that was a very 
important thing I heard and I, it made me think about really um, that without an action your wish just remains a wish. Uh, there was an art a point of conversation we had and I said I wonder why this girl was able to achieve it and I wasn't and uh, the response I got was that it was her goal whereas for you it was just a wish and made me realize that's so true oftentimes you know the difference between those that have succeeded and those that have just wished for it is the action is the lack of action to be more precise so if you really want to get something done in life Plan it, of course, it's good to have an idea of how you're going to execute it, but uh, don't delay your action because whoever gets you know, up early, does it earlier, is usually ahead a step of you. Um, so just make sure that you act upon whatever wishes that you have in life to turn your wishes into goals that can be achieved. The second question was, there were a lot of questions about elegance and that is how do you define elegance? Is it more fashion or style? And there are a lot of related questions about elegance saying, you know, um, you know, you don't look conventional, elegant way. Or some people said, you know, how do I, um, how do I remain to be an assertive boss, uh, an entrepreneur, uh, but still maintain my elegance? I think uh, we have this um, misconception or rather stereotype about what elegance means. And oftentimes there are certain symbolism around elegance and that is a certain style of dressing a certain style of of handling yourself a certain style of being but to me really elegance just doesn't come in one shape or form i have seen very bossy very strong women that are very outspoken and that are still very elegant so i don't think that elegance means being submissive being soft-spoken being you know not saying what you think hiding your emotions you can really be both and for me elegance is not just in the attire albeit attire plays a huge role in the overall impression that we make to the world but i think there's so much more to elegance than just your look sometimes i see women that are dressed head to toe very proper looking a certain way but really the way they handle themselves does not exuberate elegance at all versus other women that could be in their sportswear, you know, doing gym and they still look so proper, so elegant, so there's some air about them. So for me, I think elegance is more a mental state and more an energy, charisma and sort of this air rather than just the grooming itself or just, you know, this stereotypical thinking of how elegance should look like. Um, so it is not just fashion or style, it does play a role but that alone will never make you look elegant. Another question I get a lot about is how do you deal with insecure people who are trying to bring you down every moment and, e and take everything you do as a competition? Uh, they say, I figured as you're pretty successful, you must come across a lot of jealous people and I'll be grateful if you could give me guidance on this matter. Uh, I used to be very uh, protective over my ideas or protective over things that I did and I would get personally really hurt when someone would try to emulate me and just do everything as I do. But I think it might be the age or it might be really growing even more confident in what I do, realizing that really no one is a threat to me, neither I am a threat to no one. Um, I In a recent meeting I had at the book club, someone asked me, you know, there are some other etiquette uh, competitors of yours and I said no one is a competition to me and I actually mean it um, just as they're, I'm not a competition to them in what they're doing because you know the world is such a big and diverse place there is a place for every single one of us and um, so to speak the demand will meet its need and if we're talking in economics terms so Every, you know, every teacher has his or her student and every student has their own teacher. So to me, I realized that uh, feeling com like hurt by this competition or getting upset over people being jealous just takes away, drains my energy and uh, the one that I can actually channel into creating more content, going forward with my work, doing what I know best and do best, uh, rather than investing it into, you know, trying to get along with people that are not like, are jealous of me, are not being kind to me. 
I realized, you know, I'm going to do what I know uh, I'm good at and let the rest, you know, the universe or energy or whatever you believe in um, take its flow. So for me uh, nowadays, it's actually a compliment that I can be a role model and inspiration for someone to look up to and emulate. And uh, you, I do realize that, you know, if someone is jealous over you, if someone like looks up to you and is trying to do what you're doing then they are looking up to you and not down so you're somewhere up above for them so and essentially it's actually something really nice for you to realize that you are somewhere above for people to look up to um, just like I always had a role models and I always looked up to them and I tried to emulate them in a way um, though we are never really 100% what we emulate because there's so much of us in in what we're doing um, so that makes me realize that um, no one is going to be you in no matter what they do and even if they you know copy paste everything you say and your style and everything they're no, never going to be able to deliver it the way that you are doing a lot of questions about being perfectionist are you a perfectionist do you have any personal tips on how to achieve the desired result without overdoing or devaluing one's work I used to be, and I still think I am in a way a perfectionist, though I stopped using that term to define myself because I think nowadays, um, I mean, people define perfectionist as they, it has a sort of a negative and a positive connotation, thinking, you know, if you're the person who is so obsessed with everything and everything looking perfect, it's a great thing, it's a great character. But then to me, in life, a lot of perfectionists are the non-doers or people that come up with excuses as to not to do things. So they pride themselves as perfectionists, whereas in reality, they're just scared or have multiple other reasons. They might be lazy. They might not have a, a full knowledge on what they're doing, trying to uh, delay the process of doing what they're you know, striving to do. And um, I realized that I don't want to anymore say that I'm a perfectionist. Uh, I try to stop defining myself with this uh, mentality because I read somewhere a phrase that really caught my attention. I think I wrote it down in my quote book that something along the line that done is better than perfect, which in real life, it proves to you that when something needs your reaction, when someone needs an action from you, doing something is better than doing it perfectly but very much delayed. So I think... In, in the most of life circumstances, we just have to act upon things and try to do it promptly, have to react promptly. Um, you know, in this crisis uh, problem solving, it's, your response, your reaction should be immediate. You might not be able to solve it the best way, but the fact that you were able to do it fast will get you ahead. In, in other terms, uh, I was thinking that it also in my professional career, if I was not good at something, and that's, for example, I never lectured in Azerbaijani language, though it's my native language. I never lectured in Russian, though I'm very fluent in it. Every time I was approached with an opportunity to do so, I would always say, no, that's not my language of instruction. My language of instruction is English. And over the years, as I've traveled and seen people lecturing and realized those that didn't even have the same level as I did were attempting to lecture and people were thankful for their lectures, I realized if they took on the opportunity and did it, why is that I'm always finding excuses for myself? So this year has really been about trying myself out in new roles and doing something out of my comfort zone to try to understand that you don't always have to put up your perfect image or do it perfectly. As long as you do it and try your best, that's good enough. Uh, going along with... Uh, about conceptions about me uh, what is the biggest misconception that people have about you i think there are a lot of misconceptions about me i think uh, because people most of the people that don't know me in person see me only online and imagine me looking like this and being like this 24 7 which is not true which is something i try to convey always on my youtube videos as well as on instagram that Nothing that you see online is real in real life or it is real for the online persona that the person is projecting. But it doesn't mean that this online persona just carries out the same, you know, uh, way of handling things or speaking or being when they are with their family, with their parents, with their kids, you know, being alone in the room by themselves. 
Um, I think uh, most of the time people ask me, how do you maintain this calmness? How do you maintain this, you know, elegance about you all the time? And the misconception is that it's all the time. And I say, I don't look like this when I am, you know, bathing two kids, running around, taking care of them. Um, I don't, you know, I'm not always calm. There's so much that happens inside of me that I don't necessarily show obviously on online or uh, because this platform is about education, this platform is about sharing knowledge, this platform is not about bringing people into my personal matters. So I think uh, often people confuse uh, the public persona or their online persona with the person, that the, the individual that is actually carrying out this role. Um, I'm sure every one of you, you know, who's working doesn't have necessarily an online media work, but has another job that you're doing. You at work as a different you than you at home with your parents or you with your kids or you with your partner. We all have different personas when we are out and about with different interacting with different people. Um, so I think the main misconception is that I'm always this calm. I'm always this elegant. I always look this prepped up. Um, I don't. Um, I also, you know, have my lazy days. I have the days when I am upset and sad and uh, there are days when I'm so down that I don't have any energy to shoot anything or um, do any content or or read anything. So it's really uh, very different. Every day is very different. And I think it's understanding that the person behind the camera is just as human as you are. And that person also goes through all the kinds of pains and, and happy moments as you do. Continuing on with the questions about my childhood and who I am, uh, please could you talk about your childhood? What traumas push you to succeed in life? I consider myself a very happy uh, person, a very blessed person because I have very loving parents, always super supportive of whatever I did, very much investing into my education. Um, I had a very happy childhood. I was always loved and cared for and protected. Um, and understood by my parents. They were very strict, so I grew up in a very strict um, family household, strict in a certain sense that uh, we had to be educated, we had to you know, behave well, all of that. But um, they were also very much open-minded about me being educated abroad. Um, me, you know, though we grew up in a Muslim country, I always had male friends. So I, uh, there was this balance between being strict and also being open-minded. Uh, so I think I, I grew up uh, pretty happy. Um, about traumas, I don't think I had really traumas inflicted by my parents, or maybe I did, but I'm not really aware of them. Um, I don't know how to answer that, but the not the trauma, but I would say something that I didn't have as a young person actually made me work better on myself and be more successful in life is that I consider myself an ugly duckling. I was never popular in school. Uh, I wasn't a popular girl. I was very much a big nerd. I was focused on my education and my grades. Um, I learned all these languages. I would spend my free time reading books. I was very much focused on self-development that I wasn't really aware of at the time. Uh, I'm happy that I didn't care much about not being loved and being popular in school because I had very loving and supportive family and, and friends. Uh, so I really didn't need that much uh, validation from, from the boys. Um, and so I focus so much on myself and my self-development that I think um, now when, when I look at myself now, I'm proud of the woman I turned to be. Um, so it's not necessarily a trauma, but really, I guess, a limitation or in a way or some kind of a, um, something that was not you were not lucky in. You got lucky when you get older. So I guess not being someone who got a lot of attention from an opposite gender, I focus on myself, on my own self-development and on my education and I blossomed and I think uh, I don't still need any validation from anyone really but I think uh, this is the story of an ugly duckling turning into a princess and um, and being satisfied in you know whatever achievement she has. Um, I think there are a lot of confidence, the confidence that I have in myself doesn't really come from my looks I think it comes a lot from the knowledge that I have, from confidence in who I am, uh, that also then shows up in my personality and my charisma overall. 
Uh, another question is, what do you regret up until now in your life? I used to be a person that lived on regrets. I love thinking about all the missed opportunities that I didn't take. Uh, I would just, you know, feel, make almost like I'll have a little like playback in my mind to case scenarios and how I would choose differently. But over the years, maybe it's the age, the wisdom, I don't know what it is, but I start realizing that everything that happened to me actually served a purpose in my life. We don't always necessarily see the purpose immediately. It sometimes takes up to 10, 15, or maybe maybe more years to realize that this was done to you in order to so for you to develop into someone that you are now. Um, the only thing I would say, and that's not necessarily a given regret, but I think it's just general realization in life that a person has to take risks and a person has to take on opportunities. Uh, do not think that you know opportunities will always be coming to you. If you don't make the best of the opportunities that are given to you, your life is never going to change in the direction that you want it to change or take the course that it has to take. Um, don't rely that someone will you know knock on your door and come with these opportunities. Go out, venture, show up, and also take risks. Um, uh, two quotes that really changed my understanding of things in life was, you know, the questions that you don't ask, the answer is always going to be a no. So for the questions that you don't ask, the answer is always a no. Asking something for something gives you a 50-50 chance. It could either be a yes or a no. So take that chance. And the second was the greatest risk of all times is not taking any risk at all. And I recently had this little fortune cookie uh, for dessert and it also had that quote so I'm actually saving it in my wallet now realizing that truly life is about taking risks of course I'm not saying you know jump over the cliff take that risk it's not about that it's a calculated risk but the one that gives you a little bit of a goosebumps and a little bit of fear but the one that you know can change your life so those are two important lessons and they're not regrets but these are the things I would do differently if I were 18 now. The next three questions are from Instagram. So the first, the, the, the majority of questions I picked from YouTube because that's where majority of my community is. And the last three questions I picked uh, from Instagram. And it says, how do you handle people who are offensive or rude to you? Uh, I'm a person who knows how to draw boundaries. Uh, because whenever I don't feel like I want to be in that setting or whatever I feel like I don't like people around me, I can always retract. I'm fine with not being around people that I'm not feeling good around. Um, I guess it also comes with self-confidence, building that inner uh, confidence that you don't need validation from other people or trying to please them so that they're liking you and welcoming you in their circle. So for me, I've learned to, you know, detract, retract whenever I needed to from people that were not uh, feeding my soul or I wasn't feeling comfortable around. But sometimes you come across some offensive and rude people in life in general. It could be through work, it could be, you know, in personal matters. And I think I have learned to be more assertive. Um, and I wouldn't say respond to rudeness with rudeness, but I wouldn't say respond with kindness to rudeness because oftentimes people don't understand um, kindness when they're being rude to you. They consider you weaker than, than themselves. So maybe it's not nice of me to uh, propagate this, but I think rudeness deserves a bit of assertiveness. Uh, you don't have to be kind, you don't have to be rude back, but you need to draw your boundaries. Um, so if someone offends me, I will either ask them to repeat what they said uh, so that they can tell this again and again to my face until they don't feel comfortable saying it, or I would just ignore them completely and not give them any emotional reaction, which is something these people often expect to get from you. Uh, and I think I just have learned to be very uh, confident in my response. So without hesitation, uh, responding to, the, to whatever they're saying that could be offend offensive to me. So if someone is asking an intrusive question, I have learned to respond, give a bit of a smile and end the phrase in with a full point. Uh, not with a question mark, not with hesitation, but rather with an assertive tone. 
The next question is, what do you consider to be your biggest accomplishment as a YouTuber? I like that the person defined as a YouTuber because if this was the greatest accomplishment in life, there's so many things I would want to talk about. So as a YouTuber, uh, I would say my biggest accomplishment throughout this whole journey is realizing how much of an impact I was able to have on people's lives. I get every day so many emails about, you know, someone getting into their job by watching my job interview videos, someone uh, really rocking in, rocking the meeting with in-laws after watching my dining etiquette videos, someone hosting an afternoon party at home after my afternoon party, uh, afternoon uh, tea video. So really a lot of positive uh, emails and messages that thank me for the knowledge I've shared. Uh, most of the people that are watching me either don't have access to these classes in their country or maybe don't have the means to access this uh, these classes and the fact that I'm sharing this knowledge for free here on YouTube, um, they have been able to change their lives and work on their skills and their knowledge. And that, I think, is the biggest achievement in my life, not just as a YouTuber, but even as a person, knowing that sitting here in Baku, in Azerbaijan, I can have such a tremendously positive impact on the lives of so many people around the world uh, just makes me feel so blessed and so thankful to YouTube as well for providing this platform to people from all around the world. And the final question for today's Q&A is, there are a lot of questions in this uh, same around the same topic of balancing time and says how to balance your work and family life to be honest uh, I don't believe in an everyday balance there are some days when I'm a perfect mother and just a really bad <laughs> worker and someone who hasn't read the page hasn't done a thing but was a really devoted mother and then there are certain days when where I wasn't probably a great mother uh, but I was really good at you know doing my work getting my shoots and um, reading a lot and having a lot of work done so I would say it's very much about not a daily balance but rather on you pick and choose the days when you need to do your work and then you pick on days uh, when you have to show up uh, I guess uh, my situation is a little bit different because I'm self-employed I'm an entrepreneur I'm a content creator I'm a teacher that you know works around her own schedule so I can't say for someone who works has to go to office and show up but I would say the best thing to do is uh, understand that uh, there is no balance and try to uh, get rid of that idea because that idea also makes you feel more pressured to try to keep the balance and that gets you anxious and stressed and then you're neither good at work nor at home uh, so I would suggest to just perhaps separate the times so when you're at work you really are devoted to your work and when you're home you try to stay away from any work related things and re be present because actually when the kids are really small and young they don't remember the duration of time that you spent with them they just remember the moments or the quality time that you show so you could be in the room with your kids for three hours um, not really being with them not being present and though you spend three hours around them you weren't really with them and then you can just show up for an hour really do great activities exercise with them jump around take them to you know get ice cream walk in a park do something together that will be memorable in their minds and they'll remember these memories that you created together um, so personally i try to uh, be there for them you know get them ready in the morning get them out to school and be present before bedtime so we have our bedtime rituals those things are something that they remember uh, something that they crave and then throughout the day they're free to do you know they go to school they come they have extracurricular activities they go to friends for play dates they go to birthday parties so that's the time i have to uh, devote to my work to create content to read um, to go to salons if i have to so i have been blessed to be able to work on my own pace and my own schedule uh, but also as a content creator i realized that uh, if i don't schedule time for my work i will never get it done so i have certain days where i dedicate to create content shoot content have it ready and then the rest of the time i have to be a mother to be present and show up wherever i have to um, so that is something i realized um, by living uh, that i don't try to create a balance every day i try to 
just create moments in my life where I am uh, productive, where I am present and where I give the best of myself. Thank you so much for watching this video until this very moment. I hope that you enjoyed this Q&A session. If you would like me to do more of such kind of Q&A sessions, please let me know down in the comment section below. And if you have any more questions, feel free to ask. I'll use some of those for my next uh, Q&A. Thank you so much and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!